Okay. Uh, here we are just revising what we discussed in the previous lecture. We're starting with module one, traffic engineering. Here we are going to give you, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 the foundation for understanding what is traffic engineering. Introduction. First of all, what is traffic engineering? How can we define it? Definition of traffic engineering according to Institute of Traffic Engineers. It says that it's the phase of transportation engineering that deals with the planning, geometric design, and traffic operations of roads, streets, and highways, their networks, terminals, outing lands, and relationship with other modes of transportation. <clears throat> it means here that uh, traffic engineering it's more focused on the operation of infrastructure. It's not on the structural design of the pavement or the highway. No, it's on the geometric design. Okay, that means uh, if you are designing a highway, uh, how many lanes you need to have? What is the lane width, the shoulder dimension? But the structure of this, no, we are not focusing on this here. Okay. Okay, then what are the primary goals or objectives in the traffic engineering? The primary objective for traffic engineering is safety. To begin with, that's safety, that's the first objective for traffic engineering. <clears throat> As a secondary objective, there is speed, there is comfort, convenience and economy. Okay, all of these objectives comes secondary to safety. The elements comprising the traffic system are basically road users, vehicles, infrastructure, okay, traffic control devices, and the environment. Road users, we mean with road users, drivers, passengers, pedestrians, okay, and bicyclists. Bicyclists are considered uh, pedestrians, by the way. Vehicles, when we talk about vehicles, we are referring to private autos, trucks and buses, infrastructure, infrastructures covers the highways, the streets, the intersections, the roundabouts, bridges, tunnels, all the rigid structures that we use for transportation. This is called infrastructure. Then the fourth element, which is the traffic control devices. The traffic control devices are basically the traffic signals that we have at the intersection and the traffic signs, okay? The last element of the traffic system, which is environment. Environment refers to weather, lighting condition, uh, and, uh, and so on. As I mentioned before, we have control over the road users, vehicles, infrastructure, traffic control. But the environment, we don't have that control. So we are going to focus our study for the characteristics of the first four elements. First of all, we are going to discuss the characteristics of traffic system elements, road users and drivers. Okay, before we start, we need to understand that road users are basically diverse by po population. There is a lot of people driving on the road and those people, they have different characteristics and different attributes and different behavior, okay? So how can we come up with properties for this random population? Basically, we take samples and we come up with values representing the society, okay? Or the driver's society. For example, we take the 15th percent and the 85th percentiles to represent the maximum and the minimum. So the 85th percent represents the maximum value. And we are talking about the minimum value. We go to the 15th percentile. The 15th percentile and the 85th percentile, we get it from the accumulative percentile uh, fre uh, frequency for the sample. <clears throat> okay, the first attributes for drivers that we are interested in 
is basically driver's field of vision, okay? Why we are interested in driver's field of vision? Simply because drivers rely on their vision and to do everything related to driving. Detecting hazards, making turn decisions, selecting acceleration, avoiding accidents by vision. So the vision and the vision field, that's a very important characteristics that we need to understand regarding drivers. Okay. The vertical field of vision, it covers uh, uh, 60 degrees above the line of sight and 75 degrees below the, 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 the line of sight. But remember, these values vary. It varies by from one person to another person. It depends on the anatomical structure for their eyes. Okay. Uh, by the way, <coughs> out of this, uh, this is 60 and 75. That's uh, how much? That's uh, 135 degrees. Okay. Only the acute vision covers from 3 to 10 degrees. That's the, 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 the vision cone that you can see clearly and you can read the values and, you know, and there is a clear vision cone, which is a little bit bigger than the acute vision cone. It's, it has a base of 10 to 12 degrees, okay? To give you a better feel for these uh, vision cones, those are re cones resembling the, the five degrees diameter and the 10 degrees. So that means while you are driving, you can see within these cones clearly, okay? The outside those cones we call peripheral vision. Okay. Regarding the horizontal field of vision, okay, uh, again, we have uh, 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 the nasal side of the eye. We have limited vision, okay, of course, by the presence of our uh, noses, okay. So we find 60 degrees from the nasal side, from the other side, it ranges from 90 to 100. Again, these values depends on the anatomical structure from person to person. Might be greater than this, might be a little bit lower than this. When we consider the two eyes, we have what we call a, a binocular vision field. That means the binocular, the binocular which is here, this area, okay, it covers from here to here. This is uh, almost uh, 120 degrees. That's a binocular field of vision, okay? Uh, outside this, this side, okay, this is called monocular uh, vision. In other words, we call it sometimes called peripheral vision. The peripheral vision, uh, uh, the, what we see in that uh, area is not as clear, okay, as what we see in the binocular vision. Okay. <clears throat> field of vision characteristics. One of the issues that affect the field of vision is the speed of the person. So the, the higher the speed you are driving at, the limited field of vision because you, you know you're starting to have so if we consider someone driving at 24 kilometers per hour that's going to be their expected field of vision okay when the speed increase to 35 okay that's that's the field of vision increasing 40 kilometers, 48 kilometers. You can see that the, the field of vision start narrowing, okay? The other outside this field, which means this area, okay? This area, uh, uh, you still can see, but you can see clearly. You cannot make a, a reasonable judgment. You can see just glimpse or things flying by. 
Okay, why the field of vision is important? Field of vision is important for traffic engineers because traffic engineers use field of vision information to do the following. First, to uh, uh, for the placement of traffic signs on the highway. For determining the sign size, the size and font of traffic uh, signs, and also for safety analysis. Okay, so that was the field of vision. The second most important characteristics of drivers, which is basically driver's perception reaction time. Driver perception reaction time basically is two components, the perception time and the reaction time. What do we mean with perception time? Basically, that's the time it takes a driver to see and understand what's going on. If there's a stimulus in front of you while you're driving, the time, you, you, you know, the eye sense what's there and convey this image to the, 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 the visual cortex in the brain and from, the, from this to, to the other parts of the brain, this is what we call perception time. Reaction time, this is the time that the brain takes to make a decision what to do regarding that stimulus, okay? Not the time to execute that decision, okay? The design values for perception reaction time, basically it's recommended 2.5 seconds for any uh, 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 maneuver that requires pressing the brakes. And this covers 95th, 90th percentile of the population, okay? For traffic signals and for signal timing, uh, the ITE recommends only one second. Why there's this difference, basically, while you are driving on the highway, you are not expected to find an accident in front of you. But if you are driving on a street, approaching a traffic signal, there is always a probability that this traffic signal will turn from red, from uh, green to red, okay? So there is an expectation. What affects, what are the factors affecting driver's perception reaction time? basically age, fatigue, complexity of the situation, presence of alcohol or drugs in the driver's body. Of course, age, it pays a toll on driver's perception reaction time. The reason for that is with age, your brain is more loaded with experience, more, more loaded with other things. So it takes time to, you know, for the brain to go through all previous experiences and come up with a decision, okay? Uh, the other, uh, the second uh, factor, which is fatigue, basically, if you are tired, uh, your neural connectivity in the brain are going to be weaker and takes longer. Uh, the third uh, part with the complexity of the situation, when you have different choices to make and all choices are difficult to make, okay, that's a complex situation. That's why it takes you longer to decide what to do. Uh, and of course, the last one, presence of alcohol and drugs. Uh, alcohol and drugs contains elements or prohibitors for neural connectivity. So it delays the, 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 the communication, the neural communication in the human body, okay, and in the brain. That's why uh, uh, someone on alcohol or drugs takes longer to react to something. So, what we have discussed so far are basically the characteristics of drivers. Now, we have pedestrians also. These are, those are road users as well. So, we will be discussing the main characteristics relevant to us, which is basically walking speed and gap acceptance. Why we study walking speed? Because basically, where, uh, in, uh, while we are designing, for example, a traffic signal timing, okay, uh, we need to allocate sufficient green time such that pedestrian can safely cross a street. 
So uh, the 85th percentile, okay, or the 15th percentile, that's the minimum, okay, uh, speed for pedestrians is four, uh, four feet per second, which is 1.22 meters per second. This covers 85% of the population, okay? However, there are 15% of the public that they walk at lower speed than this. Those usually require some assistance in crossing the streets, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, it's rarely to see those, those elderly, okay, walking alone on the street, okay? However, the median or the, the, the 50th percentile is 1.5 meter per second. So the second uh, attribute for pedestrians that are important is gap acceptance. What we mean with gap acceptance? Gap acceptance basically when there's two cars, you know, for example, there's a car here and there's another car here. Okay, uh, this is the distance here. This is the gap between two following cars. Okay, uh, what is the acceptable gap for uh, for pedestrians to cross? So that's the the gap acceptance criteria, and it depends on the perception of approaching vehicle speed. Also, it depends on the number of lanes and the lane width to be crossed. Okay. Also, it varies from by age and gender of pedestrians. Of course, older people they are more cautious, and females usually, you know, more cautious than males in that issue. The average, uh, the recommended design value is 37.5 37 meters as a, a gap, acceptable gap for pedestrians to cross. And uh, this covers 85th percentile of the public. That means there's 15% of the, of the public, they will need a longer gap to cross the street. Any questions so far? Okay. So what we have discussed so far are basically the characteristics of road users. And we discussed uh, drivers and pedestrians. For drivers, we focused on a, a field of vision and on perception reaction time. For pedestrians, we focused on a pedestrian speed, walking speed, and gap acceptance. Now, we will shift and go to vehicle characteristics. First of all, we need to understand the different classification of vehicles. Also, we will discuss the turning characteristics, the stopping and the climbing characteristics. So, according to Ashtu, there are four categories of vehicles, passenger cars, buses, trucks, and recreational vehicles. What do we mean with uh, uh, passenger cars? What we see here, these all are you know, this is considered as passenger car. It's not, yes, you, we call it van. This is minivan, okay? But according to Ashtu, it's a passenger vehicle. Uh, some might consider this as a truck. No, this is a pickup truck. Pickup trucks and also this one, okay? These are passenger car. The reason for this is basically the relationship between the horsepower of the engine and the total weight or the gross weight of the vehicle. Okay, so that's the criteria. So, you know, for example, uh, uh, the, the Ford, uh, this is Ford 150, okay, truck. That's the name, the same, sorry, that's the same chassis that they built the Ford Expedition on. Okay, and the same engine almost. So that's the issue. That's why. So it, but it, it's a, we call it bigger. This is the bottom line. These are passenger cars. These are buses. Okay, I'm sorry. 
Okay. These are buses. The buses covered here, you can see here, this is an intercity bus, okay, that's connecting between uh, uh, cities. And this is a transit bus, okay. And this is a school bus. This is articulated bus. Okay, sometimes you see it in the airport. And this is what we call mini bus, okay. These are buses. And here are the uh, trucks. It starts from this two axial trucks and goes to down to the 18 wheelers. Okay. Please, someone is open, you know, someone needs to. Abdurrahman, could you just mute yourself? Okay. So these are trucks, okay? Now, what are these? These are recreational vehicles, okay? Uh, it starts with uh, a motorhome, okay? Which is basically a bus, but it's retrofitted to be a motorhome, okay? So that's the first one. Uh, of the list. Then any car after that, this is passenger car, and this is a passenger car, okay? But it's towing something. Here it's towing a boat, here it's towing a jet ski, or, or this camber, okay? If a passenger car is towing one of these, then it's considered an recreational vehicle. Why? First of all, it occupy a longer distance or a, 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 long, a you know a larger longer space on the on the road. That's number one. Number two, its behavior in acceleration and deceleration is similar to a truck. Okay, so it's not a passenger car anymore. Once you have this configuration, this is called RV, and there is an adjustment factor specifically for this one, because we cannot treat it as a passenger car any longer. Any questions? Okay. So that was the, the different classifications of vehicles according to Ashton. Then we will start now talking about the low speed turning or the turning characteristics. First, we're gonna discuss the low speed turning. Okay. Uh, the low speed turning here, the geometry of the vehicle plays a major role in determining the characteristics of the low speed turning. Okay, the number of axles, the distance between the axles. But what we are looking for in the, 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 for the low speed, we are looking for the minimum turning radius, okay, or the minimum inner radius, uh, the wheelbase width, and the minimum outer. Uh, turning radius, okay? And also the path of the front overhang. And we will discuss this in details here. For example, here we have a design vehicle. That's the design vehicle we are having. And that's the minimum inner radius, okay? This, the maximum outer radius. And this is the path, the dotted line that you see here. This is the batch of the front overhang, okay? And that's here, the wheelbase width, okay? Those dimensions are critical. Critical, why they are critical? They are critical if you are, you know, making a, a geometric design for a parking lot for an intersection or something like that. You will see here, for example, this is the, 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 the wheel, you know, uh, uh, the, or that's the, the designing the, the radius of the curb at an intersection. That's the path of a passenger car. That's what we need for a bus. So in order to accommodate different design vehicles, these low speed turning characteristics are important because it determines the geometry uh, needed to accommodate these vehicles. Here, for example, that's another intersection. And as you can see, you know, instead of allowing parking here, no, 
this is not allowed. That's why we limit the parking back here. So a, a, an 18 wheeler can make a safe turn without uh, finding the road. For passenger cars, it has no problem, okay? But for an 18 wheeler, the turning characteristics that, you know, dictates that the sparking should not be exceeding this point. Okay? Any questions? Okay. The high speed turning, the high speed turning, that's a different story. Because when vehicles are turning on a curve like this, there is centrifugal force, if we say that that's the vehicle. And that's the radius of turning. Then, if this vehicle is driving at speed V, okay, there is a force, that there is an acceleration, which is called central, uh, central, centrifugal acceleration. The centrifugal acceleration, if we multiply it with the, with the mass of the vehicle, we have mv square over r. That's the force. Okay, of course, this force here, the force is here, for example. Okay, and the balancing is its own weight and the friction that's coming from the pavement. When we solve this problem, we come up with this formula, okay? In this form, formula, the speed, that's the speed of the, of the vehicle, that's the radius of the curve, G, that's the gravitational, uh, the gravitational acceleration, okay? So that's here, G. FL, that's the side friction, or the slipping friction, the skidding friction, you can name it. And E, that's the super elevation, because in, on horizontal curves, we make this banking of the road, you know, so the side of the road is higher than the inner radius of the road. So that means if we take a cross section here, that's what you see. You see, what this is, we call it super elevation. Okay. Of course, the side friction <coughs> decrease with the speed. It's not similar to the longitudinal friction. We have, if we have a vehicle here, okay, and these are the covers, the, the, the wheels of the, of the vehicle, okay, uh, there's a longitudinal friction and there's a side friction. This is the side friction, okay? The longitudinal friction remains the same, but the side friction with the speed, it decreases down to 0.1 and even lower than this. This curves shows the relationship between the side friction factor and the speed of the vehicle. Okay? Any questions? Excellent. And here we uh, uh, we had a pro we had an example where we uh, uh, made a uh, given a design speed for the highway to be uh, 120 kilometers per hour. Please determine. The, the minimum radius for a horizontal curve. If the super elevation was limited to be uh, 3% or 8 and 8%. We solved this uh, last week, last lecture, but we are gonna solve it again. Okay, we start here. Okay, I'm sorry. We start here with E for the 3%. For the 3%, uh, we are going to substitute an E. So this is 0.03 plus F. What is uh, uh, here? The speed is how much? 120. Let's go up 120. So that's F here. How much this? This is 0.85 almost. So we can say plus 0.085 
this equals how much? V square over GR. So we have 120. Remember, 120, this is kilometer per hour. So we had to uh, multiply it here, 120. Okay, let me, let me just multiply this here by 1000 and divide it by 3600. So this way it becomes meter per second. And this is square divided by how much is uh, we have G and R. We have 9.81 multiply radius. So in other words, we can say that R equal the 120 multiply 1000 divided by uh, 3600 is 33. So this one is 33.33 square divided by 9.81 multiply by uh, 0.115 equals and in the second case where we have E, so that's E, if E equals 8%, then R equals, again, 33.33 square divided by 9.81 multiply 0.08 plus 0.085. So if we, someone do, can make uh, this calculation, please. So. Uh, the first one. Yes. 984.7 point seven. and what are the units meter the meter. second one one to be six hundred eighty six point three meters Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Now, that was the, the high speed turning characteristics. Now we're gonna talk about the vehicle stopping characteristics. The vehicle stopping characteristics, basically, these are one of the most important characteristics that we deal with when we are talking about uh, uh, transportation and uh, traffic engineering. Basically, if someone, I'm sorry. Okay. If we have a vehicle traveling here at V, uh, the initial speed, then, for example, he sees something at the end here. Okay, so it takes him time to make, to see and understand and make a decision. Okay, then by the time he starts pressing the brakes, he would have, uh, you know, uh, driven or V initial times PRT. So that's the first distance. Then he starts pressing the brakes. Basically, he starts here with a kinetic energy half mv initial square. And here ends with a kinetic energy half mv final square. In the meantime, because he is pressing the brakes, so the friction force, there is a friction force. 
the friction force is basically the mass times gravity, which is the weight multiplied by, by F. The friction force is doing a work, okay? This work is basically multiplied by distance D2. So the change in the kinetic energy equal this work. So delta, that means uh, M G F D2 equals the difference between both, which is half M V, v uh, uh, initial square minus V final square. If you remove M with M, cancel it, and we take this to the numerator here, to the denominator. Okay, so this goes here. We end up with this relationship. Okay, that's assuming that we have a, a horizontal road. So there is no potential energy. Okay, but if there is a, 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 a a slope in the road, that means there is a grade in the road, okay? Then there is another factor that if the, you know, that's assuming that G percent equal zero. If there is a grade, that means this road is going up or going down, okay? Here, uh, the, the, this will, will, will uh, be added to the, uh, the, the numerator here. So the general form is basically perception reaction distance plus breaking distance. That's the stopping distance. It's the perception reaction distance plus breaking distance. Okay. And here, this is the uh, general form for the vehicle stopping distance. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we'll take a break for 10 minutes and we will be back at 11 o'clock, inshallah. Okay? Okay. طيب. في موقع كنت قلت لكم عليه اللي هو بيادزا، يا ريت الكل يسجل فيه لأن دي هتبقى حلقة الوصل من حيث الهوم وركس ومن حيث التفاعلات. مع الكورس ان شاء الله تمام آه هنا آه هنا احنا اتكلمنا آه على الستوبنج كاركترستكس اوكي آه هنروح بعد كده دي طبعا في ابلكيشنز هنا لاستخدام الستوبنج كاركترستكس في حساب اليالو تايم والاور ريد تايم او اللي هو الكليرنس تايم في التقاطع تمام ده مثال ازاي بنحسب اليالو تايم اللي في السيجنال اوكي ده في حاله اللي هو الثرو موفمنت السيارات ماشي سيده اند ذيس از فور ليفت تيرنينج موفمنت اند وي ديسكاس ذيس اكزامبل بيفور اوكي اند وي سولف ذيس بروبلم لاست تايم اوكي هاو ايفر we have uh, a problem set. This problem set, you don't see it now, right? We see 2.2, 2.7. Okay. This is the problem set that I'm going to be uh, posting for you to solve. Okay, problem set number one. Okay. So we start with part one, driver and vehicle characteristics. Okay, and uh, part two, traffic stream characteristics. Uh, part three, capacity analysis and level of service, which is basically all of this covering module one. So I'm gonna assign to you this week, this, uh, this part, part one, okay? And I will send you a notification with this on, uh, on your emails, okay? Okay, to start with, let's try to solve this problem. The problem, the first problem is say, a car hits a tree at an estimated speed of 50 kilometers per hour on a 3% downgrade. If skid marks 
of 30 meters are observed on dry pavement. Okay, F, that's the factor of uh, coefficient factor, uh, was 0.345, followed by a 75 meters, okay, on grass. The factor of the coefficient of friction here is 0.2. Of, uh, on a grass stabilized shoulder. Estimate the initial speed of the vehicle just before the pavement skid was begun. Okay. Okay, let's solve this problem. Okay, I'm using here whiteboard. Okay, here it says the car hits a tree. So let's first draw the problem that's the tree okay and the car ended up here hitting that tree and it says that it hit the tree at a speed of 50 kilometers per hour so here the v was 50 kilometers per hour 50 kbh okay but it says that there was a skid mark that's the highway or that's the road. There was the, the, the skid marks started here on the pavement, then started here on the grass. It ended up here. The distance the skid marks were on the pavement, it starts from here to this distance and from here. So this distance was how much? Thirty meters uh, observed on pavement. So the first sector or the first part of the skid marks, it was thirty meters. And on the grass shoulder, it was seventy five meters. Now we want to determine before this car started or before this driver started pressing the brakes, was he driving on the speed limit or was exceeding the speed? So here the V initial is unknown. That's what we want to determine. So how can we solve this? Okay, let's assume that we have three speeds, V1, so that's the V1 at the beginning of pressing the brakes. Then he exits here at V2 and ends up here with V3. So now we have, you can consider this as kind of a threefold problem or a pro, uh, two, two parts problem. Let's consider uh, the second part. This, let's work from backward forward, okay? So let's focus on this part. This part we have D equal 75 meters equal uh, V3 square. Okay, no, V initial square, V2 square minus V3 square divided by 2G f2 because here we have f2 coefficient of fraction and we have here f1 f1 was how much uh, the coefficient of fraction here was 0. Uh, 3, 4, 5, and the coefficient of fraction here was 0. 0.2 So let's substitute for the values and D we have 75 equals V2 square, this is unknown, minus V3 square. V3 is basically, that's the speed at which this car hits, you know, hit the tree. So it's 50 kilometers per hour. But again, we need to have the, all these values in meter per second. So this will be 50 divided by 3.6 and that's square divided by 
2 multiply 9.81 multiply okay there's another issue here it says 3% downgrade 3% downgrade that means here we have minus 0 0.03 So we have here point 0.2 minus point 0.03. Downgrade means it's the slope is going down. Upgrade, the slope is going up. So let's solve this problem. We have here V square, V2 square equal 75 multiply 2 multiply 9.81 multiply 0.17 okay and this is plus 50 over 3.6 square how much would be this V2? Can someone cal do this calculation, please? Uh, 21 meter per second. 21. 0.04. What are the units? Meter per second. Meter per second. Excellent. Okay. So now let's go to we solve with the second part. Let's go to this part. Here D equal. Doctor, excuse me. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, I'm sorry. I got it. Okay, what, 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 do you, okay, that's fine, never mind. So here we have V3 square minus V2 square divided by 2G multiplied by F1 minus 0 0.03. So we have 30 equal v3 square minus v2 square is how much is 21.04 square divided by 2 9.81 multiply uh, 0.345 minus 0.03 Okay, so that means V3 square equal 30 multiply 2 multiply 9.81 multiply 0 0.315 plus 21.04, uh, sorry. So that means V3 equals uh, 25.06 meter per second. 25.06 meter per second. Excellent. Which is multiplied by 3.6. How much would be? Almost 90 something. 90.2 kilometers per hour. Extradi me V1 and it's two more la V3. I'm sorry. This is V1 in my food. That's the initial speed that we want to get. So this one should be V1. Okay, 
كيلومتر بير اور مفهوم يا شباب يعني احنا هنا شفنا الانيشال سبيد فاينل سبيد اوكي بس اي واز كونفيوز وذ ذا نوتيشن سو اي يوز في 3 في 3 از نوت سو في 3 ار دون وذ ات هير واضح يا شباب يبقى احنا هنا ذا فاينل انسر في 1 ايكوال 90.2 كيلومتر بير اور Any questions? So, as you can see, we have used the stopping characteristics of vehicles in accident analysis, for example. Okay, so that's a typical application for uh, 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 the analysis of uh, 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 you know uh, stopping characteristics for vehicles. Okay. Now we go to the second part, which is basically the traffic stream characteristics. But before we go there, we need to take the attendance piece. Let's go back now to traffic stream characteristics. And we discussed last, uh, last lecture, the main issues here, uh, basically, we have two classes of traffic stream. We have uninterrupted and we have interrupted. For the uninterrupted, uninterrupted facilities, this is, you know, referring to highways, freeways, uh, interstates, this kind of uh, facilities. Uh, there is no interruption for the flow. The flow there is no traffic signals. There is no, uh, uh, you know, at grade intersections. There is nothing of this. And the access for these facilities are usually by on ramp or off ramp. Okay. However, uh, if there is any interruption in the flow, that's because of the traffic itself, not external to the traffic. Or no, okay. For the interrupted facilities, anything else is an interrupted facility. For example. Uh, if we look at uh, King Faisal uh, Highway, okay, it's not a highway. It's that's an interrupted facility. You have uh, inter you have roundabouts. You have traffic signals, okay. So that's interrupted facilities. But if you look on the contrary to King Fahd uh, 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 Freeway, for most part, you can consider it as a freeway uh, a facility. Okay. Okay. What are the, the parameters that we, we, we usually use to describe the traffic stream? We have two sets of parameters, macroscopic parameters and microscopic parameters. Of course, you know that macroscopic, these are parameters that are aggregate. Okay. It describe the whole uh, 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 things together, but the microscopic are more precise and individual basis. So the macroscopic parameters, okay, are the volume or the flow rate, the speed and density of the flow. Then the microscopic parameters, these are speed, uh, headways and spacing between vehicles and speed of individual vehicles. So first we're gonna start with the macroscopic parameters volume flow rate speed and density regarding the volume the traffic volume or flow rate what is the definition of traffic volume traffic volume or traffic flow rate basically defined as the number of vehicles passing a point on a highway or a given lane or direction of the highway during a specified time interval so that means vo traffic volume or flow rate that's number of vehicles, bear time. Number of vehicles passing a point per time. Okay, the units is basically vehicle per time. This time can be hour, day, week, or year. We have uh, different, you know, we have daily volumes, for example. The daily volumes, we have average annual daily traffic volume. We have average annual weekday traffic volume. We have average daily traffic volume. Okay, what's the difference between the annual daily traffic volume and just the average daily traffic? Usually, 
uh, in uh, metropolitan areas, in municipalities and stuff like that, we have what we call permanent count stations. Okay. These permanent count stations count the traffic volume, okay, over a long period of time. Then, uh, uh, you know, every year we calculate the average for these uh, uh, volumes, okay? But if, for example, if we want to do a project or something, we can put some counters somewhere and we take measurements for daily volumes, then we add it and take the average, okay? then it becomes the average daily traffic. So the average daily traffic, you can calculate the volume on a street or something for maybe a month or so and divide it by the number of days, then that's an average daily traffic. But if you count it for a complete year, then this is what we call annual uh, daily traffic volume or average annual daily traffic volume. Okay, how we use these volumes? The daily volumes are used basically primarily for network planning, design, feasibility assessment of major projects, uh, prioritization of maintenance, but we don't use it for design. Okay, we are not, we don't use these volumes for, uh, you know, uh, designing a uh, number of lanes or uh, designing uh, 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 traffic facilities or traffic signals. Why? That's an example for the traffic volume, the, uh, the average annual traffic volume. And why we don't use the, uh, the average daily traffic volume or the average annual daily traffic volume for design? Because basically the traffic volume varies over the day. During 24 hours, okay, it varies. It goes up and goes down. There are peak hours. There, are di there is directions, you know, for example, in, in the morning, you will see one side of the road congested. In the afternoon, the other side of the road becomes congested. Okay. So here, instead we use what we call directional design hourly volume. Basically, we manipulate the average annual daily traffic volume and we multiply it with a K and D. The K here, this factor, basically determines how much of the daily volume occurs during the peak hour. And the D, that's the percentage of traffic during peak hour in which direction, in the peak direction, okay? To give you a better understanding, okay, of course, the K factors and the D factors, these are H2 recommended values. So, by the way, H2 is an, is an American Association of State Highway uh, Transportation Officials, okay? That means these K factors and D factors are very useful and very realistic for the United States of America. But here in Saudi Arabia, you need to come up with your own factors and use it. However, we can use these factors as a guideline, but we need to have an expert judgment on, you know, how to, to select these values here. Here, for example, during 24 hours, we have at night, we have low traffic volume. Then during morning peak hour, we have a high volume. K gives us the percentage of traffic volume during that peak hour. Of course, uh, you have studied in structural engineering and in uh, reinforced concrete and steel design that we design for the worst case scenario. That's in traffic context, this is the worst case, this, uh, you know, uh, condition that we design for. So if you if the if the facility or the highway can handle this situation, everything else it can handle. Okay. So basically, so uh, okay, uh, the value that we get if we calculate the average annual daily traffic volume, that's what we get. That's the average daily volume. That's why we need to take this value, the, the total volume per day, okay, and come up with these, try to get these values. How we get the directional design hourly volume? Again, by multiplying the average daily traffic volume, multiply it by K and multiply it by D. It's clear or not clear, Shabab?
by the way, if we have the highway like this, that's the median, okay? And that's a traffic stream this way and this way, okay? The average daily traffic volume is basically the total volume in this side and the total volume in this side together. So if we are designing one side of the road, we need to know how much is going here. So that's why we have this D. D give, a, give us the split of that total volume, okay? For example, if you look here, the D factor, let's say we're gonna take the 0.65. That means 65% going in that direction and in that direction, in the other direction, we have 35%. Okay, so this D factor determines the split between the congested. If we say that this direction is congested. So the congested direction gets 65% of the traffic volume, or that's the peak direction during peak hour. Wadah, shabab. Okay, we go here. Uh, one of the other parameters that's important for us, which is the peak hour factor. The peak hour factor, uh, or the first of all, what is the peak hour? It's defined as the single hour of the day uh, that has the highest traffic flow rate. Okay, how can we estimate the peak hour uh, and the peak hour factor? Okay, to better explain this, let's go to this example. Okay, let's just eliminate this. Let's start solving this problem. Okay, now here we have, uh, we you know, in order to, 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 to find the peak hour, we need to do traffic counts every 15 minutes interval. Okay, uh, for two hours, for example. So we, we, we are guessing that the peak hour in this case, it occurs in the morning between 6.30 in the morning and 8.30. But when exactly and how much, we don't know. So these are the volume counted every 15 minutes. Okay. So what we do, we calculate, we add this number, you know, the first four together. How much is the, these first four? I need someone to calculate this piece. How much here? ممتاز شكرا يا عبد الرحمن 2000 كم؟ 300 66 ممتاز طيب هنجمع دول كام يا شباب؟ ايه؟ من أول الثانية من أول الثانية وتجمع أربعة ألفين وثمانمية وثمانية ألفين وثمانمية وثمانون ممتاز لا هنجمع دول ثمانية ثمانية دول ألفين وثمانمية وثمانية طيب ولا تزعزي صح اللي بعده ثلاثة آلاف سبعين ثلاثة آلاف سبعين 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 مو سبعة أوكي طيب طيب اللي بعده كم ثلاثة آلاف ومئة وستين اللي بعده كم؟ ممتاز 
فين البيك اور فوليوم بقى هنا يا شباب فين البيك اور اعلى فوليوم بنشوف ذا هايست وي لوك فور ذا هايست فور كونسيكيوتيف ها تايم بيريدز سو وي هاف فروم هير تو هير اوكي سو ذات مينز اور بيك اور از فروم 7 15 to 8 15 peak hour volume equal uh, 3160 vehicle per hour طيب how can we calculate <coughs> the peak hour factor peak hour factor equal the peak hour volume Okay, divided by four multiply the max or V fifteen max. And show V. If we have a can period one, two, three, four. The period that we can have the maximum volume for can can D. So here the peak hour factor equals The peak hour volume, which was in camp 3160, divided by 4 multiply 865 equals camp. Point nine one. Okay. Remember, peak hour. Factor, okay, is less than or equal one, and greater than or equal cam. Point two five. Tamam. Okay, what does it mean? Uh, the big hour factor. If the big hour factor is high, and for example. Let's say that the big hour factor equal 0.95 and the big hour factor equal 0.75. What does it mean? I will tell you what does it mean. If the big hour factor is close to one, Okay, that means the traffic flow is almost uniform. There is no wide variations in the traffic flow. Okay, but if the big hour factor is, you know, very low, that means there is a high variations during the big hour factor, during the big hour. Okay, that there is randomness in the flow. The flow is not uniform. Okay, and this is plays a major role in in uh, in uh, signal timing and delays and stuff like that okay but for you as a construction engineer you don't have to worry about that but you need to understand that there is a big hour factor okay uh, the second parameter that we are interested in was it which is basically the time mean speed or the speed in general so we have two types of speed we have Time mean speed and space mean speed. What is the difference between time mean speed and mean speed? Let's define both of them. The, the time mean speeds, okay, is basically the average speed of all vehicles passing a point on a highway or lane over some specified time period. Okay, that means you stand on the highway with a speed gun and start measuring the speed, okay, for a number of vehicles. So that's basically, and take the average that's the time mean speed, okay? But the space mean speed is different. The space mean speed, you take, a, you know, it's basically the average speed of all vehicles occupying a, a given section of a highway or lane over some uh, a specified time period, okay? That means if you have maybe, uh, you know, 10 vehicles or 15 vehicles or 20 vehicles, you see how long does it take all of them to 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 you know to cover a segment of the road or to pass a segment of the road okay 
So this is space mean speed. Usually space mean speed lower than time mean speed. And it's more re realistic to the actuals, but it's difficult to measure, okay? To give an example, okay, these are, uh, you know, 10 vehicles and they are, you know, passing a segment. They, we have a segment, say that we have a segment, you know, from this point to this point, it's 500 meters, okay? And vehicle number one, passes this in in uh, in 10.4 seconds uh, vehicle number 26.6 .6, okay if you divide the time per time you know the the distance per time you get these speeds here it's 48.08 meters per second 75 these are very high speeds by the way 75.76 and so on if you take the average for these, you get us, you get the time mean speed, 61.61. But if you take the total time, okay, and the total distance, okay, and you calculate, hmm, the, if you calculate the average time for these uh, 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 vehicles, like here, here, if you divide the distance by the average time, okay, you will get something different. For example, here, uh, the average time is how much? We have 68.9 divided by 8. So we have, let's go the space mean speed. Space mean speed equal uh, 500 divided by 68.9 divided by 8. That's the average time it took all these vehicles to pass this distance. How much will be the result? Uh, 58.055. How much? 58. 58.055. 0 0.06. That's meter per second. But here, if we calculate the average for the speed, it's 61.61. Okay? That's why we say that the space mean speed is more... Uh, conservative and it's more realistic to the actual to give you a better value okay type now okay the last parameter which is the traffic density traffic density is defined as the number of vehicles occupying a, a given length uh, of highway or lane, okay? And usually it's expressed as uh, vehicles per kilometers per, uh, or vehicles per kilometers per lane, okay? Yani number of vehicles per unit length. To give you an example for this, traffic density, that means if we have, if you have a, a, an image for the highway like this, okay, you have, the vehicles here. You count the number of vehicles for this length. And density will equal to number of vehicles per L multiply with N. N, that's the number of lanes. So this way, you will end up with a, a value and the units will be vehicle bare kilometer bare lane, okay, like here. 
vehicle per kilometer per lane. Okay. Any questions? Excellent. So the the last uh, set of characteristics will be uh, the microscopic parameters. The microscopic parameters are basically the uh, spacing, which is the distance between vehicles. Okay. Okay, and uh, the the you know the density can be measured from the spacing. If we say that the spacing, the distance between vehicles, okay, is uh, dA. So dA is defined as the distance between successive vehicles in a traffic lane, measured from some common reference point on the vehicle, such as the front bumper to or front wheel. Then, if we have this distance, if we divide uh, 100, you know, 1,000 by the dA, we get the density. Okay. The headway is different because the headway it takes into consideration the uh, the the speed of the flow. So headway is defined as the time interval between successive vehicles as they pass a point along the lane. Also measured between common reference point on the vehicle. Okay. Yani we use it to, you know, if the, you know, we can calculate the flow rate based on this. So basically how we measure the headway, if that's the highway and we have a car passing and a second car And we are standing here. Once this first vehicle pass, maybe from the first bumper here, we have a stopwatch t equals zero. When this car comes again to this point, okay, and from the same reference point, that means if we are measuring from the front bumper to the front pump, then we have t2, so t1 equals zero, t2, that will be a headway. That's the time headway between these two successive vehicles of course it depends on the speed the distance between so it's not the distance from here to here for example no it's the time between the passage of two successive vehicles if we have the average headway okay on a highway say h bar that means every every two seconds for example we have a vehicle passing what does this mean? That means the flow rate Q equal 3,600 divided by two, okay? Then we have 1,800 vehicle per hour. If every two seconds you have one vehicle passing, okay? That means in 3,600 seconds, that's one hour. How many vehicle will pass? 1,800. You get this point. Any questions? Okay. So now we will discuss the relationship between flow rate, speed, and density. The flow rate, okay, if we consider this is the flow rate and this is the density. When we don't have that much traffic on the highway, you know, uh, uh, the flow is almost zero and the density is almost zero. When the flow starts increasing, okay, then uh, 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 the density increase, the flow increase. By the way, if we say that Q equal V S times D, the speed of the flow multiplied with the density, okay? That means at this point, if you take a tangent, that's going to be the free flow speed. If you take a tangent at this point, that would be the free flow speed. But as 
the volume start increasing on the highway, okay, the 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 the, the speed start reducing and the rate of increase until we get to that point. That point we call it saturation flow rate. That's the saturation flow rate. Beyond the, and that's the critical density. Beyond this point, okay, the flow start going down, but the density start to increase. That's when we have congestion. So this this area, this is congested flow, this is stable flow, okay? And that's the critical point at the saturation. When we exceed the saturation flow rate, okay, then we get into congestion and the, the traffic jam starts building, okay? At this point, the traffic is not moving, but the entire street, the vehicles are stopping. That's similar to the density you can observe at a queue at the traffic light. Here, the relationship between speed and flow rate. As we mentioned, when the flow rate is zero, we have the free flow speed. Then, as the flow rate starts increasing, the speed starts decreasing until to get to this point, the saturation flow rate. Beyond this point, the speed increase until we get to the jam density. Here, we are presenting the different uh, relationships between uh, speed and density. As we know, it's logical that the more dense flow we have, or the more density we have, the lower the speed is. So the speed relationship with density is inversely proportional, okay? So the first one that suggested the model for this was a guy called Green Shield, okay? So he came up with Green Shield model linear relationship that the speed V equal free flow speed multiplied by one minus D over DJ. Okay, so that was the first model. Then Greenberg came in 1959 and came up with this natural log uh, relationship, okay? Then there's an Underwood model exponential negative exponent okay came up with this uh, relationship but the bottom line for all of this is that the speed relationship with density is inversely proportional and we usually use this in our models to simplify calculations any questions so far okay guys i will conclude at this point and next uh, week inshallah we will start discussing the traffic control devices is there any questions? Any comments? Thank you and uh, see you inshallah next week.